Good morning. This is Jason Dean, a film fanatic. Hope everyone's doing good. The uh, the show that I did last, actually yesterday, I did a show about, as a whole, the entire or general discussion and review of certain uh, certain of the certain films in the franchise. But I did a, a show on the uh, Friday Thirteenth franchise. And I basically talked about overall the you know the emergence how that became a franchise and and films certain films in the series that I'm I'm really a huge a huge fan of as a whole I'm a huge fan of the entire franchise and again it's like it comes back to like the other show I did about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre another like real beloved film for me and hugely inf influential both of those films both Friday 13th and Texas Chainsaw Massacre I was kind of reluctant to do a show on them only because those both both those films and, and in particular this this show which I'm doing one on Friday 13th the original I was kind of reluctant to do a show on it and talk about it just because those films have been discussed to to maybe at nauseum to the degree of where they they've been debated and talked about reviewed you know by millions of people so i was always like well what could you know what will me do to contribute to that conversation probably not very much but at the end of the day those two films have had such a huge impact on me as far as you know it's just from you know being really an integral part of my youth especially the friday 13th films i mean these films i've seen you know probably at the end of the day i've probably seen these films more than any other films i've seen in my entire collection or just in general in my entire life I, you know these were all f movies that were heavily uh a part of my childhood, you know, used to, and I remember even seeing a couple of them in the theater when I was a real little kid, and seeing them on tape, cable, and you know, the days of VHS, and it was something we always watched. And uh, I remember watching a lot of these films growing up as a kid with my with my family, and you know, it just had such a, you know, it was just such a part of my of my culture. So I'm like, okay, I need to talk about it because. They really, you know, these films have played such a, uh, you know, huge part of, of my, you know, kind of development, I guess, as a person. That maybe that says something for me as a person, but, but anyway, and then going back to things music related, I always try to tie in Quantum, and talk about updates around that band, because to me that's a that is such a a part or an extension of my f love of film. So, and Friday 13th is obviously a huge, huge inf influence on that band, particularly around like the aesthetics, the masked killer in the series, Jason Voorhees notoriously would wear the, the hockey mask. So that was a real huge you know my my deep love of masks. That's one of my strange little hobbies that I do, outside of film fanatic stuff and and watching movies and reading books or whatever. I like to collect masks, and so that whole like kind of aesthetic was a huge influence. Anybody who's seen our live shows, we you know we try to pre present like a visual theatrical. Uh, experience to the shows and we usually use masks and wigs and s stage props and and that that aspect of it is directly taken from this franchise you know like Jason Voorhees for case, case in point the whole mask kind of thing creating your own identity uh, you know in a, in a in the spotlight and also the whole aesthetic around it but then the the film score also um, Henry Manfredi, who wrote and composed all the music for the the, the 
for the Friday Thirteenth franchise. I remember that also being music that uh, it was the first music that I remember getting exposed to that really left an impression on me as far as uh, music that was a part of a film. And that really, you know, really inspired me, even as a little kid. So, and that stuff still continues to be a real big, you know, inspiration. And Henry Manfredi used typically for a lot of his music, he would use a lot of classical instrumentation, orchestras. But he also, you know, dove pretty heavily into using synths and electronics. So there was also a little bit of that going on too. So that was also a big exposure to, you know, to the world of like more modern stuff. So, and, you know, the minute you hear that music, you just know it's part of the movie. It's it's like you can't have one without the other. It's I, I feel like the music that was created for those films by Henry Manfredi is like onto itself a separate character. So it was a huge part of of my whole like collective experience, and continues to this day to really you know influence Quantum. So and it's an interesting thing because years ago I. Uh, you know, I got really into film when I was in college. I had one, two, two good friends, Charlie Hendrick, and then also Sean Russell, who I've talked to, talked about a lot in other shows. And I actually had Sean Russell as a guest on Film Fanatic quite a few months ago. But those two guys really, I'd always loved film and horror movies and stuff growing up as a kid. Uh, ninja movies, you know, the age of VHS, and and then I got into DVDs, but I always loved movies, but those two guys turned me on to a lot of films, and in particular, a lot of different directors, and that's kind of where the, the, the deep love or the obsession started. I started to really, you know, uh, really dive heavily into it, you know, I remember, like, getting into Stanley Kubrick, um, directors like Kira Kurosawa, I mean, you name it. There's endless amounts of directors. And also George Romero. I mean, the list is endless. But I started to find you know, find out who a lot of these directors were. And then I just started diving into basically all the films that they had had directed. So that's where it started. And then, I, and then at that point, I started collecting movies, DVDs, uh, back in the days when, you know, before Blu-rays. And I started, you know buying lots of movies and I started to really, you know, it's it started being a real uh, thing for me where I was just immersing myself into all of these different films and other films too, other styles. I really got into documentaries. I really got into, um, you know, foreign films. Uh, but so it just, yeah, it just opened this whole new world and deep love for me. And at one point I, I you know, I had after years of, watching movies and getting more and more passionate about it i had this idea of like okay i'll maybe i'll try getting into filmmaking to some to some capacity you know i don't know what that would be like but maybe to some capacity and around that time i was playing in this band that was called full contact kitty who i've probably mentioned before and we were a band that was kind of in the vein of like you know we were kind of this weird you know, artsy rock band, very noisy, but we were like really inspired by groups like Sonic Youth, uh, Velvet Underground, the Pixies, and and then we we're also my girlfriend at the time. She was, we had started the band together, and we were really, we were both into film a lot, and we were really into uh, one director in particular. We were really into was David Lynch. And that became a real big inspiration for our music. Angelo Bedellamenti, who was the composer for all of David Lynch's films. So we had all these different influences. We had the cinematic kind of influence from taken from those movies and his movies in particular. And we started creating this band, Full Contact Kitty. And at that time, I had a friend who, our, our mutual friend in our little circle, who was... Uh, 
basically in video or in in um, film school. And so we had this idea of like maybe we'll do some shoots of like you know various uh, working with different models or different you know creating these different environments and filming them, and maybe we'll like. Uh, try to like incorporate that into the live performance kind of like what the velvet underground did uh, with Andy Warhol where they you know would film these short little clips and basically project the stuff on the band so we started doing that and I started working with her my friend Shannon and we started filming these we we would work with these different models and we'd experiment with different colors different lighting a lot of the stuff was in black and white and some of the stuff was kind of gothic looking, had like a gothic aesthetic. And we basically would film these music videos or these little clips of these videos. And and some of them came out pretty good. And then at one point we decided to like, she had this really big projector. So at one point we started to bring the projector to gigs and we would have the stuff that I shot, we would project it on the band. So we'd have all this, these images these like black and white kind of semi spooky gothic images projected on us while we were playing. And we did that for a while and it was really fun. And I thought that there were times where it really uh, seemed to connect with an audience and it felt like it can, you know, kind of really put us in a kind of an interesting s space to play music. And uh, it was, you know, it was very theatrical. That band used to use, you know, also used to use lots of theatrical things. We were makeup and costumes and, you know, we basically dress up like Halloween, you know, like it was like a Halloween party. So that was like the first time I was in a band where we did a very like heavy theatrical kind of thing. And we did that for a while. And then a few years after that, I had this crazy ambition or idea of maybe I'll like actually try to direct a film. And so I did this really crappy, horrible movie that was called Rapture. And it was basically a 20-minute vampire film that I did. And I did that with Vince Gabriel, um, who was a friend and a, musician, a great local musician. He had some really nice cameras at the time. And we basically shot this film around Belfast. And we shot it here at my house. We got a bunch of actors involved. And we, you know, basically did this thing guerrilla style and we just shot all this footage and we shot for about three three weekends in a row and you know and then we edited it all together and and it was a lot a lot of work it was an intense amount of work and and it was you know it was pretty expensive to do for something so small and and I was really into uh at that time I was watching a lot of uh hammer horror films you know a lot of the classic fan uh classic dracula movies starring the iconic christopher lee i was watching those those are movies that i loved as a kid still love today and i was also i was really into that kind of aesthetic and those kinds of films and then i was really into um directors like uh john cassavetes and jim jarmusch where a lot of the scenes had very little dialogue and particularly those, and John Cassavetes, where he would uh, basically have no script and all of the dialogue was kind of improvised. So we, that's basically what we did with this film. And it was a vampire movie and we basically had it all kind of mapped out to a degree of what, we, what I wanted. But the, the dialogue was, we would just do a bunch of different takes, but the dialogue was improvised and we would give people cues as to what we were going for, blah, blah, blah. And we, we did the film, and then we actually had a show. We There used to be this great art gallery in Belfast called Aarhus, and we actually had the premiere there, and we showed the, the movie there. And, you know, it was a cool experience. I mean, the movie is... Uh, it's not really anything I would show anybody now. It's pretty awful, uh, like really bad. And I like a lot of movies that people consider to be really cheesy and terrible, particularly things in the, the grindhouse exploitation world but the movie that i did and again it was like you know i had no experience at all it was the first time ever trying to like kind of make to try to make a film i uh you know you know i wouldn't i you know 
came to the conclusion after some time had passed that it's just a bad, unwatchable movie. But I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And so a couple of years after that, I had this, I started writing a script uh, for this other film that I was going to do. And it was kind of going to, it was going to be more in the line, on the lines of like a gangster movie, pretty violent, dark kind of gangster film about this hitman. And so I started writing the script for that. And I was getting some, you know, getting some uh, ideas together. And I started collaborating with a few people. A couple of people had, who had gone to uh, Me Media Workshop in Rockport, which is like a really world-renowned uh, film school. And I had met by chance a few people that work there. And I had passed the idea to them. And they were kind of into the idea of what I had. And... And this one person I was working with in particular, we were like kind of co-writing a script. But she thought like my writing, uh, you know, I needed somebody else to kind of more or less do it. Like she thought the idea was good, but the script wasn't very good. And so we, we went back and forth for a while with different drafts and numerous drafts. And this went on for a long time. And, and then after... A period of time I started to we kind of settled on, on an idea of what it should be and we kind of were un, under some like agreement so I started shooting some of the uh, I more or less started shooting the film and I had a couple actors that were in, involved and and it just kind of we would start and, and then things kind of, kind of stalled we just I don't know what happened it just got it was really disorganized and didn't really have a clear idea of what I was trying to do. And it was a lot of st starting and stopping and it was really disorganized. So it kind of went away, but I kind of kept the idea that I, you know, I really want to try to pursue this thing and try to get the experience of making more films and maybe become a, you know, a filmmaker someday. And cause I, at that time I had such a deep love. I was really getting into all kinds of films and blah, 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 but nothing really came out of it uh, as far as a second project. So, cut you know or fast forward you know maybe seven years <clears throat> and when I started my quantum group I I was at that point you know really into like uh, collecting lots of films and I really got into um, more and more things all the time. And I found myself like drawing more and more influences. Like, and I started writing for my band quantum it had just started. And I, and I found myself drawing more, drawing more and more influences from, I mean, music was obvious, like bands and things like that, that I was listening to, but I found myself drawing more and more influences from film, you know, the aesthetics of horror films certain directors I really love, um, even like the pacing of how um, a film would be laid out, character development, all these things, the aesthetics. And I noticed that a lot of these things were kind of spilling into the band more and more. And then also the theatrical content, you know, with using masks and props and wigs and all kinds of lighting, all that stuff was being taken from all these films that I was really loving and watching all the time. And over a period of time, I realized like it, it started to satisfy that desire that I had about being a filmmaker or diving more into that world to a degree. And I realized that this was like a different kind of strange um, avenue and different, but I found as my passion for filmmaking was growing and as a musician, this was like a, a perfect kind of combination of where I could kind of put those together. And suddenly that part of my brain of where I was like kind of craving to be a filmmaker to a degree was, was satisfied. And I felt like, well, this is like, I can do both. I can kind of like take from both of these worlds from music and film and especially film and, and incorporate that into the music that I'm writing. 
you know, with the influence of soundtracks, the aesthetics, all those things. And I found myself really, really satisfied in doing it in a different way as opposed to being like a quote unquote filmmaker per se. And since then I've like, that's what I've done. I've never, I don't, you know, that that's been a big part of my life. And so I don't really have a desire to, to make a film per se. It's more on a thing of where I feel like I have this really nice outlet and I can pour all those influences into it and it's satisfying at the end of the day. So, yeah. So this brings me to Friday 13th. So Friday 13th, a couple of, or yesterday I did a show on the, more or less a uh, general show on the entire franchise. And in light of all of the the new things that have come out, because Sean Cunningham, who was the director, um, there's been all of this, you know, all of, all of the, all of these stories in the news about how basically they were not going to be making any more Friday Thirteenth movies because <coughs> these legal issues between Victor Lewis who is the creator, and also Sean Cunningham, who is the director. Sean, Sean Cunningham had directed the film, and Victor Lewis had co-wrote the story, and Sean Cunningham also did too. So it's been in the news for a while. The last three years, I believe, has been in, they've been in court. Basically, Victor Lewis sued Sean Cunningham for the rights of the film and the franchise for creating the characters. And just recently it was announced that the case is like over there. I guess there was a decision or a settlement. And it was announced that there's now going to be more uh, movies coming out in the franchise. So I thought that was kind of exciting. Because it's been about 10 years since the last movie came out. Which I actually really like. And it was more of a reboot of the franchise. A reinvention. But it's actually a great film. So, that spurred my interest on watching them again. After, you know, I've seen these movies probably more than any other film or group of films than, I, than anything else I've ever seen. And I bought the box set, you know, re, like two years ago. They come with, you know, an amazing amount of special features. There's a really great interview on the, in the box set um, with Victor Lewis. And he was talking about how uh, the whole franchise as a whole has made uh, like, th I think, two or three billion dollars. Um, and it's un unbelievable, considering that this movie started in 1980. The first movie came out in 1980, and then, and then the franchise started after that. And, you know, there's super low-budget, grimy, uh, you know, exploitation movies, essentially. There's another cool interview where Sean Cunningham, you know, when they were, him and Victor Lewis were trying to figure out what they wanted to do because before they got into the whole like slasher world and created Friday the 13th, they were making, essentially, they were making these uh, kids movies and they were not having any success. They were writing these scripts and directing these movies and there were these like kids movies and they were just not really going anywhere. And Halloween had just come out. So they basically modeled it the idea of Friday the 13th off of John Carpenter's Halloween. They basically, you know, ripped it off. And then it, and it was, you know, done on this totally shoestring budget and it went on to make, you know, an, an insane amount of money. And so this is like the first show I'm going to do where I'm going to review each movie uh, in the franchise because it'll be fun and I've been watching the movies again and it's been a lot of fun, you know, you know, revisiting a lot of these great films. And, you know, it was also one of the first movies that Kevin Bacon was in, which is amazing. Um, you know, it was Betsy Palmer, who plays Jason Voorhees' mother. She was a pretty, you know, well-known actress at the time, taken, you know, taken, uh, she was more in the light of where she was taken seriously as an actress. And she, I guess she hosted a, a host of a game. She was a host of a game show at the time too, in the 70s and 80s. And, uh, you know, and she eventually got this role in 
and it you know became this phenomenon and she you know she really hated uh you know the slasher horror genre as a whole but this ended up you know making her career again and uh and you know it's the first role of kevin bacon and you know it's amazing like and this was like the first slasher film that kind of came out that was so low budget and then it just like took the world by storm i mean it was released by paramount pictures a major hollywood company and and then after this film came out it just spawned you know an endless amount of slasher exploitation movies after that all these other directors were you know the field was so crowded uh all these other directors decided to try to cash in on it and so like you had you know so many movies coming out during the during the period like right after this film came out that was like you know astounding like there's just so many and a lot of them were trying to you know cash in exploit that audience that made this movie so popular and then after the success paramount approached both victor miller and sean cunningham about let's make another one let's make it and then for the next 15 20 years they made and it grew into this like massive franchise pretty unprecedented and i i i think it's it's Arguably, I would say that, you know, even outside of, like, the quote-unquote horror genre, uh, it's, it might be definitely in the horror genre, but I think it might be the biggest franchise that there is, you know. Um, during this time, you know, there was no no real such thing as, as franchises. And now it's pretty commonplace, you know, the Harry Potter films and Lord of the Rings films x-men marvel films i mean you just name it it's it's a it's a thing that's that happens now all the time where there's like sequels to one movie that might be a hit or and then they they try to do a peak a, a prequel or a spin-off so there's all of these uh things and and but back then in night in the late 70s and 80s you know there was no such thing really as that so this movie really kind of brought in this this whole like new model for companies that were making films and if they were successful you know what could they do with it you know i mean like the other ones that in the horror realm i mean obviously the texas chainsaw massacre huge genre halloween genre huge genre you know huge franchise the saw franchise the purge uh franchise i mean the list is endless so this movie, in a lot of ways, even even with it being such a sh you know a small small budget, and it went on to make as many million, I think it made like seventy eight million dollars, and this was in the year nineteen eighty. So when you look at the economics at that time, like that's a lot of money, um, even by today's standard standards. So and then this went on to become this like kind of legendary franchise for what it, for what it is and for what it was. So yeah, pretty unprecedented. So yeah, stay tuned. I'm going to be do, doing an, uh, another show soon on uh, Friday 13th, Chapter 2. So thank you again. This is Jason Dean, and it's always a pleasure. And if you get a chance, like and subscribe my page, to my page, and we will see you next time. Cheers.